Good afternoon, Sean Nettleton, Bex Hybrid, Southern Illinois field agronomist. I'm standing in a bean field this afternoon in Southern Illinois, and believe it or not, it's July the 9th and these beans are at R3. And so because we've started to get a few beans, uh, reaching that stage of R3, that critical timing, uh, I thought I'd do a little video here this afternoon on timing for fungicide applications on soybeans. And so I realized with the season that we've had thus far, uh, we don't have a lot of beans near in this stage yet. Uh, this particular field of 366 is where it was planted April 23rd. And so there's a few hundred acres in, in this area uh, of Southeast Illinois that uh, the guys got in, got to plant a few hundred acres uh, there in late April. Uh, and then we were rained out again until May. And so if by chance you had an opportunity to get in there, you might have some beans that are nearing R3 as well. And so to dive right in, a couple neat things about this particular farm. One, it was, it's soybeans, like I said, April 23rd. Uh, we're monitoring soil moisture in this field with a crop metric soil probe. And so we've got a soil probe in the ground 34 inches deep. Uh, we're monitoring soil moisture throughout the growing season here. So this particular farm was planted into cereal rye. And it's been cereal rye for the last number of years in a corn soybean rotation. And what's really interesting is with the amount of rain we've had here in 2019, a lot of the fields that we're monitoring have really shallow roots, both soybeans and corn. And, uh, and, and that, that makes sense because when there's no oxygen in the soil, uh, roots can't go down and therefore we have really shallow root systems and that's one of the things we're fighting uh, with some, some tough looking corn fields. Um, what's interesting about this particular field is that we're monitoring them, we're seeing soil moisture or we're seeing root rooting and soil moisture uptake down to 24 inches deep, uh, maybe 26 inches deep in this field. And so my hypothesis is that some that the soybean roots were able to get into some of those rooting channels left behind from the cereal rye and and, and those roots are really down there uh, really utilizing a bunch of that uh, that soil moisture in the profile and so what i would expect is as this current conditions of sunny and dry weather that we haven't had a lot of but in the near term the forecast looks really strong for dry hot conditions exactly what we need uh, as this as it continues to potentially dry out, I would expect this field to hold up really well uh, based upon the fact that we've got roots down to a, a really, really deep depth. And so just kind of a little background on this field. Uh, what's interesting is, um, like I said, this field of beans is at R3. And so I wanted to do a, a little bit of quick video on timing a fungicide application. But uh, this is a random plant that I grabbed here from, from the field. Uh, I walked out into the spot to be near the moisture probe, and what I found was I found a main stem and I found seven branches, all with nodes on the branches, uh, all potential places for pods to develop, as, as we see. And so, you know, I, I talk a lot about this in, in, in some other videos when we talk about early planted beans versus late planted beans. Uh, to me, a big driver of yield is a couple different factors. And so we start with plants, and then we have nodes per plant, pods per node, and then seeds per pod, right? And so that's how we kind of drive yield. And so the later we plant, the more plants we need to put out because we know that our node counts are generally going to be late or less uh, due to the fact that our vegetative period is going to be much shorter. We get these early planted beans and we have nodes like crazy. And so we've got some really good yield potential uh, on these beans. They were planted at 145,000, probably standing somewhere around 110 to 120 uh, based on weather conditions after planting. And so let's jump right in here. We'll look at the main stem here. Some of these branches are kind of starting to break off. But uh, so we talk about uh, R3 soybeans is a 3 16 of an inch pod anywhere in the upper four nodes of the plant. And so we'll go one, two, three, and four. And right here at four, we've got a small pod starting to develop. Quite possibly it's 3 16 of an inch here at node number five. We see a pod that's about a half inch long here where my finger is, okay? And so uh, whether or not you determine that these, these beans are R3 today, they will be R3 this week for certain. And so let's determine, let's talk about the R stages. And so R2, if, we go, if, if we're looking at a little bit of early side, if we're out there trying to, to get a handle on when R3 is, R2 would be a bloom anywhere in the upper two nodes of the plant. R3 is again, is that 3 16 of an inch pod. Uh, that we've been talking about there in the upper four. And to get to R4, you're talking about a three quarters of an inch pod anywhere in the upper four nodes. And so 
here we've got one probably half to three quarter at five. So, so that's kind of where we are. These beans are nearing application timing. And so this grower uh, has opted to go ahead and make a fungicide application. And so what I was out here doing was scouting to kind of see what we had, of, had out here uh, as, as, as disease pressures and insect pressures. And, and so what I'm saying, there's a bean leaf beetle crawling on my finger there. Uh, disease pressure wise, for the amount of rain that we've had on these farms and these fields this spring, disease pressure is relatively low right here. There's some septoria, a uh, leaf spot out here that we would expect tends to start low in the plant, can climb its way up. So it's good to protect against that. Um, as far as frog eye leaf spot or sarcospora or anything like that, we're not seeing any of those diseases now, uh, but we're going to go ahead and treat this field uh, uh, for disease. We're going to treat it as a plant health benefit. And so things to consider, we want to hit that R3. Uh, Beck's PFR research has kind of uh, talked about uh, R2, R3, R4. We've done research and tried to spray at all those stages. And what we found is that uh, it's, it's, we do not require a very high market price to break even uh, with, with the R3 soybean. We go to R2 or R4, so we miss that timing. Uh, we're talking about nine, 10, $11 beans to be able to break even on a fungicide application. So, so getting those beans timed and getting them staged is critical uh, to the success and the return of a fungicide application. And so what about putting an insecticide in here when we make a fungicide trip? Okay, so that's a question that we're gonna get a lot of. Uh, my opinion is we have a fair amount of, of Japanese beetles here. I mentioned there was a bean leaf beetle crawling on my finger there a bit ago. Uh, I just looked around a little bit ago. There's some stink bugs floating around. Uh, you name it, there's something out here chewing on these beans. Now, a typical, uh, a typical threshold for Japanese beetles is about 20% feeding. So a 20% of a leaf area needs to be fed on for there to be a threshold you know, across the field. I don't think we're at 20% today, okay? But I think about the additive effect of bean leaf beetles and Japanese beetles and stink bugs and grasshoppers, you name it. While we may not be at a threshold for one insect, I feel very, I feel very confident that the, the, the masses of them, all of them together, would equal enough that justifies with the cost of insecticide to go ahead and treat these fields, okay? So it may not be an IPM approach. We may not be hitting threshold levels. However, I believe the return on investment is high enough that we should go ahead and, and utilize an insecticide on these farms. And so to think about this way, you've got options, okay? There's the pyrethroids. You can buy them generics. You can buy them name branded. Uh, cost is very low on those. Gives you great knockdown, okay? So you can utilize those, get some good knockdown. But being that it's the ninth day of July and we've got a lot of growing season left, I'm going to look for some of these products uh, that provide a longer residual. So speak with your retailer. Uh, utilize a product that's best for you. But along with the fungicide, I recommend throwing in an insecticide and try these insecticides. A lot of these are like a co-pack or, or, or a mix of, of a couple different products, one for knockdown and one for residual. And I think that's going to be a lot of benefit to, to keep these, these, these insects, these hard shell bugs, uh, keep them at bay. I'm getting a lot of questions about foliar nutrition. Okay, so I've already done one video. We've been doing a lot of tissue sampling this summer. Uh, this farm was tissue sampled actually this morning. So the guys co-op came in, tissue sampled this. We're gonna try to wait until we get those results back because we've got some PFR proven products that we can throw in for foliar nutrition. But this gentleman would like to take more of a targeted approach. Okay, so he's gonna get those tissue samples back. We're hoping to have those back. They were pulled and mailed today. We should have them back by Thursday, Friday. We wanna see what's actually going on in the plants. All right, so we wanna see if there is a nutrient deficiency that we need to address. And so we're gonna to try to hold off this fungicide application for a couple days until we get those results back and then take a targeted approach and apply, apply a product if we need to based on the need that the plant is telling us it has. Another thing I get a lot of questions about I wanted to address is can we put a herbicide in with our fungicide pass? Okay, and so I think this is an important topic because I get this question every single year when we get the fungicide timing. Hey, can I throw some Liberty in the tank and clean up some escape weeds? Or hey, can I throw some glyphosate in the tank and clean up some escapes? Or, or you know, can we spray Extend, Extend and Max and, and, and those Dicamba products with a fungicide application? And across the board, the answer to that is no. Okay, so based on the label, if we look at a Liberty label, Liberty says Liberty label says you can apply Liberty up through R1. Okay, so we talked about that earlier. R1 would be bloom. Okay, R2 is a bloom in the upper two notes. So the, the cutoff for Liberty 
is almost two growth stages ahead of where a fungicide timing is. Same with extend. The extend is 45 days after planting or R1, whichever comes first. Um, and so, so that would be uh, off-label as well to utilize uh, the dicamba products in a post-application with, with fungicide at R3. And then glyphosate's the only one that's close, but a glyphosate, I looked at the PowerMax label, and glyphosate says R2. And so those blooms in the upper two nodes, we're targeting R3 with the 3 sixteenths of an inch pod in the upper four nodes. And so we need to leave the glyphosate out as well. So, so based on label recommendations, we really should not be utilizing any herbicides when we're making a fungicide application. We should be targeting fungicides, insecticides, and foliar nutritional products if we have a need or a desire to give these beans a little bit of a shot in the arm when we make that application. And so, uh, really exciting to see some beans get here to this size. Uh, really neat to see what the moisture probe is telling us, that we've got good rooting depth, we've got good soil moisture throughout the profile. Uh, these beans being plant, getting opportunity to plant them early have got lots of potential. So let's protect them with that fungicide. Let's keep the, the insects at bay and let's try to feed them with some nutritional products uh, as we go through the season. And so with that, Sean Nettleton, Bex Hybrid, Southern Illinois Field Agronomist. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'd love to help. Thanks. Have a great day.